Well, that was pretty cool. All right, so obviously that beginning B-roll sequence was shot on the Canon 60 Mark II. And funny enough, that's exactly what today's video is about. How to get the highest quality, top-notch video with the Canon 6D Mark II. Let's go. All right, so to achieve that top-notch video quality we're talking about with the Canon 6D Mark II, you gotta be using the best settings. All right, so the first thing you're gonna wanna do is switch your mode dial on the top of the camera to the manual setting. This is gonna give us complete control over the camera. Now that you're in manual mode, you'll wanna go into the settings and make sure you're shooting it in the highest quality video resolution that this camera offers which is 1920 by 1080. And while you're setting your video resolution, you'll notice that under that same resolution setting, you'll have a few options for frame rate. Now frame rate is gonna be the speed of your footage. If you're shooting a cinematic film, you'll wanna set your frame rate to 24, or it's represented as 23.98, I believe. And that's if you're shooting in normal speed, but if you plan on slowing down your footage in post-production, you'll wanna shoot in 60 frames per second, which is also represented as a weird number. It's like 59.94 or something like that. And that's, again, if you plan on slowing down your footage in post-production. After you set your resolution and frame rate, the next thing you wanna play around with is shutter speed. And what you set your shutter speed at is gonna depend on what you set your frame rate at. And there's a general rule in cinematography called the 180 degree shutter speed rule. And it basically states that whatever you set your frame rate to, you wanna double that and that's gonna be your shutter speed. So if you're using a frame rate of 24 frames per second, you'll wanna double that, which is gonna be one over 48 for your shutter speed. However, there isn't an option to set your shutter speed to 1 48th of a second on the 60 Mark II, so we just go to the next number up, which is 1 50th of a second. And the same rule applies if you set your frame rate to 60 frames per second, you'll double that and you'll get one over 1 20th of a second. But again, there isn't an option for one over 120 for a shutter speed on this camera. So we go up to the next closest option, which is one over 125. Then the next thing you'll wanna do is set your aperture. And this setting really depends on what you're shooting. For instance, if you're shooting a very specific subject, something like a phone or even a person, then you're gonna to wanna to set your aperture setting really low. I recommend something between f1.2 and f4, because that's gonna give you possibly one of the most important aspects of cinematic video quality, which is a blurry background. But if you plan on shooting something like a landscape, then you'll probably wanna do the exact opposite of what I just said and set your aperture number higher. Something between f8 and f16 will most likely be fine. Then you got ISO and you'll mainly wanna make sure that this number doesn't go over 1600. Anything higher than that and it'll make your footage look green. And you don't want that. Now for white balance, this one all depends on your situation as well. But it's pretty self-explanatory. If you're in a sunny situation, set it to the daylight setting. If you're in a cloudy situation, set it to cloudy. If you're under tungsten lighting, set it to tungsten and so on and so forth. Then you got picture profiles. And for this, if you don't plan on doing any heavy color grading in post-production, or really any color grading at all, or if you're just new to the whole editing process, then I recommend setting it to the standard picture profile. However, if you are a bit more experienced in the post-production process and do plan on adding a pretty thick color grade, then I recommend using the neutral picture profile. This will give your image a more gray toned look and give you a little bit more information to play around with when it comes to color grading. This will allow you to push those shadows and those highlights a little bit further rather than if you went with the standard picture profile. And last, but certainly not most least, focus modes. So in the 6D Mark II, you have four different focus modes to choose from. And those four are smooth zone autofocus, live one point autofocus, face tracking autofocus, and manual focus. And which one you pick really depends once again, on what you're shooting. And honestly, I use each one, but the one I use the most is probably Smooth Zone. And that's because I find that it does a pretty good job at holding focus on the correct part of the subject that I want it to focus on. But there are some times when I'm doing a tracking shot of an object and it doesn't work out the best. For instance, take this calendar. If I wanna focus on the specific corner, sometimes the smooth zone autofocus won't work. So I'll set it to live one point autofocus instead and select this point on the subject. And it usually does a pretty good job. Then obviously face tracking, 
I'll use this if I'm vlogging or shooting YouTube videos like this. And then manual focus, I'll use this sometimes, mainly if I'm trying to get some creative shots, something like a focus pull, like a rack focus, something like that, I normally use manual focus. So at this point, our settings are basically perfect but you'll most likely need a few extra pieces of gear to get that top-notch, high-quality cinematic video. One of the more important pieces of gear is a lens, and for this setup, I'm using a Sigma 24-70 f2.8, and I would recommend getting something in this focal range, or at least close to it. I know this one's kind of expensive. I'm pretty sure it comes out to close to 1100 bucks. If you want something cheaper, I recommend getting the Sigma 18-35 f1.8. I'm pretty sure that one's around 600 bucks on Amazon and you have that f1.8 so it's going to give you that blurry background that we all desire. Then another very important crucial piece of gear especially if you're shooting outside is an ND filter and for this I know the Peter McKinnon ND filters are very high quality so I'm not saying I recommend them because I haven't used them I just know they're really nice but I do recommend the KNF Concept if you're trying to ball on a budget. And the one I'm using is an 82 millimeter variable ND filter from ND8 to ND128. And for those of you that don't know what an ND filter is, it's basically sunglasses for your lens. And what it allows you to do is drop that aperture number lower, giving you that shallow depth of field, therefore a blurry background. Because if you don't have an ND filter, then it's gonna to be too bright outside for you to actually lower that aperture number, therefore letting more light onto the sensor. And if you're getting more light onto your sensor, then it's gonna result in a brighter image, and that's why we need an ND filter. Kind of long and drawn out, but ND filters are pretty important, so make sure you get one. And then another very important piece of gear, a microphone. And for that, I'm using the Boya BY-MM1 shotgun mic. This microphone's pretty cheap. It cost me around 30 bucks on Amazon, but the quality is still pretty good, especially for a budget-friendly mic. So if you're looking for a cheap mic for your setup, check out the Boya BY-MM1. If you want something a bit more higher quality, check out any of the Rode shotgun microphones. And then the last piece of gear, I don't use this very often, but it is a camera cage. I really only use this thing when I'm trying to be super professional and I have the time and patience to set it up. It's not that it takes long to set up, it's just that it's another thing to add to my rig. It is helpful though, because you do have a top handle and even the side wooden handle, so you'll hold the, your camera on this side and then you got the wooden handle over here, offering a little bit more st stability to your entire setup. But I wouldn't really say that you absolutely 100% need this, but if you do wanna check it out, it's called the Canvate Camera Cage. And I'm pretty sure it runs for about $82 on Amazon. By the way, if you wanna check out any of these products I listed, I'll link them all down in the description. All right, so we got the settings, we got the gear, but how exactly do you shoot high quality cinematic video. For that, we gotta talk techniques. And one of mine is that I always try and get a variety of different shots. Panning, tilting, dolly in, dolly out. I think you get the point. Getting a variety of shots like this isn't gonna contribute to the video quality per se, but it's gonna allow you a little bit more flexibility when it comes to piecing the video together in post-production. On top of that, another thing I love doing to make sure that I get the best quality video out of my camera is using the histogram and the light meter. Those two tools in your camera are gonna give you the best possibility of nailing exposure every single time. Because the best way to get the best footage out of your camera is by getting the shot right in camera and not just saying, hey, I'll fix it in post. Another thing that you need to do if you're shooting video on the 6D Mark II is to make sure your movements are steady. A few tips I have for this is to lock your elbows in. Don't lock them in to where you're stiff. Stay loose, but don't have them out like this. Otherwise, you're gonna be bouncing with the camera like that if you walk. Having them locked in like this, though, is gonna give you a little bit more stabilization. And make sure you're not gripping the camera too tight or too loose. Same thing with the elbow lock. You wanna make sure that you got a nice firm grip, but something in between tight and loose. Then once you got all that down, if you have to do any moving or walking shots, I recommend trying the signature Peter McKinnon Ninja Walk. Peter used to show it off all the time in his videos, but it's basically just a nice and easy, steady heel to toe walk. And by his logic, it helps reduce camera shake and stabilizes your camera altogether. And as funny as it sounds, it actually works. And the last tip I can leave you with if you wanna get amazing footage on this camera is to use a wide focal length if you're shooting handheld 
and then anything over 35 millimeters, you wanna put this camera on a tripod. And that's because when you're shooting at a wider focal length, something like 24 millimeters, it's just gonna be easier to stabilize that footage if you are shooting handheld. And any movement with the camera at a wide focal length isn't gonna be super abrupt or jarring. However, a more telephoto focal length, something like 50 millimeters or 70 millimeters, those movements are gonna be super abrupt and way jarring if you are shooting handheld. And that's why I recommend putting it on a tripod if you are closer to those telephoto ranges. All right, so you basically take all that information that I dropped in this video, wrap it up in a bow, start using your camera. You'll get some awesome footage, I guarantee it. If you guys wanna see more videos just like this one, subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks for watching and always remember to capture great moments. Peace.